Thanks, Shigeki. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, as you can see on my first slide, um, I've added lots of people who've been involved with my work. Um, and clearly there's not enough space on this slide to include everyone. So um, there's been an enormous amount of support I've had. I came up with the idea in the first place, but then everyone else has done a fantastic job of taking that idea further. So this, I'm pretty excited about this I Icona project. Um, so I'll just talk you through how, um, how we go about these CO2 sleep studies, because I see there's lots of people in the audience, over 50 people, who maybe don't know much about um, these CO2 sleep systems. So what we, what we do is we measure the pH of the sea water, and usually that's on the total scale. And we measure the alkalinity of the water, its salinity and its temperature. And with those four pieces of information, we can calculate everything else about the carbonate chemistry. For example, the amount of um, carbon dioxide in the water or the saturation state of carbonates. And when, when, when you start studying a CO2 seep system, you have to get the carbonate chemistry uh, right. And from that point onwards, you can start looking at the abundance and the diversity of the microbes or the flora and the fauna. And that's the, the typical starting point of any of these studies. And then after you've worked out what's living where, you can go on to sort, sort of more complicated questions like the biomass of the organisms or their behavior or their um, photosynthesis and so on. So I think, I think these um, natural analogs of the future are, are wonderful but they can't um, answer all the questions in isolation. And actually they're most useful when they're, they're set up alongside um, other types of approaches. So for example, the geological record shows us through fossils, the ocean acidification has caused um, and exacerbated mass extinctions in the past. And the shells of, of, of sea life have changed through these periods. And we know that for, for a fact. There's also been huge impacts of ocean acidification to industry, particularly in the USA, where they found it very difficult to grow shellfish because um, the water's become too corrosive to the larvae of um, the juveniles. Lots and lots of laboratory experiments have cropped up over the last um, 20 years, showing that actually ocean acidification can affect all aspects of the life of these organisms. And there's been a few, because they're expensive, um, field mesocosm experiments as well. And so all of these things can act together to help inform us about what's coming up over the next few years in terms of the effects of increasing CO2 on the ocean. Now, a really, another really cool thing about CO2 seeps is that they can help us work out what's going to happen if carbon dioxide sequestration um, goes wrong. Um, it's getting pretty serious um, with the effects of carbon dioxide on the climate. And so we're looking to um, perhaps sucking uh, CO2 out of the atmosphere and putting it below the Earth's crust or into the ocean. And that will have consequences. So there's this nice paper I saw um, yesterday that's talking about um, the groundwater CO2 interaction around um, the, the Canary Islands. And so the, the Canary Islands obviously are volcanic and there's this um, pool of water, um, which is seawater below the ground that's got high levels of CO2 in it and that permeates out across the surrounding um, habitats. So th that's an analog for the effects of um, carbon sequestration. Now, I'm, I'm proud that our CO2 seep research is being um, cited and used at the highest level internationally. So the IPCC, for example, in their latest report about how carbon dioxide affects the ocean and its ecology um, is, 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 is heavily cited in, in, in this report. And also the United Nations report on, on the world ocean and its status also heavily cites the work that's going on at CO2 seeps. And 
it's actually having an, eff an effect, a, a, a positive effect. Um, I don't know, it's difficult to gauge in, in to what extent this CO2 seed research is um, influencing um, reductions in carbon dioxide emissions, but certainly it adds to the argument and promotes the case that these reductions are needed. And so nations like the UK are actually leading the way in decarbonizing the way we get um, our energy. So the energy supply there on that graph is, is, uh, has come down a lot in terms of CO2 emissions. Things like transport are still uh, lamentably high, but across the board, CO2 emissions are coming down. And, and um, of course, we know from CO2 seat research at, at um, volcanic analogues of the future that this is desperately needed. So um, yeah, it's good. We're having, we're having some sort of effect. So this is a, a tectonic um, map that I often show of where CO2 seep systems exist. Um, they basically occur wherever tectonic plates are either moving under each other or spreading apart. And in the case of the Mediterranean Sea, they're spreading apart. Uh, no, they're moving together, sorry. So Africa is moving into Europe um, tectonically, and that's creating huge volcanoes and boiling the chalk that's in the seabed and that comes bubbling up through the sea floor. And you can see obviously around Japan, there's um, a similar process occurring where you get um, carbon dioxide coming up through the sea floor. Now, sometimes members of the general public think that maybe this is the cause of ocean acidification, but it's very, very minute compared to the, um, the amount of CO2 that's being taken up by fossil fuel burning um, 30% of which is entering the ocean. So um, this isn't the cause of ocean acidification, but it's a very good way of looking at its um, future effects. So here's a picture of a diver um, around one of these CO2 seeps, and you can see the, the gas bubbles coming up through the seabed. Now in some CO, CO2, high CO2 seawater areas, you don't see any bubbles because the water's already been um, increased in CO2 levels underneath an island, for example. But for um, media purposes, it's very useful to show um, the, the carbon dioxide actually coming up like a jacuzzi through the seafloor. Now, in this particular photograph, I've, I've, I've come to realize that in areas like this, where the seabed is relatively barren of marine life, there's probably other toxic compounds involved in affecting the ecology. And so that's one of the things we need to get right, first of all, is to make sure that we're investigating the effects of high carbon dioxide rather than, for, rather than, for example, the effects of hydrogen sulfide or um, other toxic compounds um, on the seafloor. Now, it, it is certainly possible to do that. You can, um, you can measure and assess, for example, the amount of metals that are um, in the, in the sea, seabed sediments and avoid those areas when we're looking at the effects of high CO2. So this is the, the first study that used uh, natural analogues of um, high carbon dioxide to investigate the ecological effects of um, ocean acidification. Now, all of the, my fellow speakers today know this study quite well, but um, some of you in the audience might not. What it is basically is it's showing you the map of Italy with an island called Ischia off there. And then this is a, a diagram showing you um, where the pH is low, okay, because of carbon dioxide coming out of the sea floor. And it affects two types of habitats there, rocky shore habitats and seagrass habitats. The seagrass is shown in green. And this was a collaboration between um, Italian colleagues Israeli colleagues and, um, and the British. And basically, uh, if you swim around anywhere in the world um, in shallow waters, this is the type of, of image you'll see. It's a mixture of crustos coralline algae, which is the pink stuff, it looks like pink paint, uh, sponges, sea urchins, there's a fish in the middle of there, you can just about see it, camouflaged, and an array of uh, branched and encrusting fleshy algae. Now that's, that's typically what you see everywhere. But as carbon dioxide levels ramp up, 
you get a complete change in colour and a complete change in the community of organisms present. So here's that change in colour. You've gone from pinks and whites, which are the calcareous organisms, to these olive green organisms, which are uh, diatoms and brown algae. And they do really, really well at high CO2 um, in the Mediterranean. And the, the take home big picture that we see um, at this, this, this site is a massive reduction in the biodiversity of marine life um, as CO2 levels ramp up or as pH levels uh, decrease. Now that's shown in this graph with the open circles denoting calcified organisms and the filled in circles showing um, uncalcified organisms and both of them decrease a lot in their um, diversity as pH reduces. And those pictures of limpet shells kind of summarize what's going on here. On the back of a limpet shell in normal conditions, you've got lots of different types of um, organisms living on there. But whereas in the high CO2 conditions, the back of that shell has been stripped of all of that biodiversity and you're just left with the, with the naked shell itself. Now, if you want to um, get an update on all the things that have been found out about this particular site, and then there's a really good re review by Fu et al in um, oceanography and marine biology. And th that really summarizes lots of the types of tax that have been investigated in detail. Now on the back of the, that, that initial study, there were these three um, that all basically found out the same type of information from around the world. So in Austra an Australian team, a Japanese team, and a, a team from the United States went to volcanic seep systems around the world and found that pretty much the same story happens wherever you go, wherever you look at the effects of high CO2, you see radical shifts in, um, in, in the community types and a big drop in the biodiversity. So that study by um, Katerina Fabricius was in Papua New Guinea, the one by Shihiri was in, was in Japan, and the, um, the, the Enox paper is in a place called Maug, uh, which is in the North Pacific Ocean. And all of those basically show um, big reductions in biodiversity as CO2 levels increase. Now, just taking the Papua New Guinea example, um, this is a picture of what a pristine coral reef looks like with all those different shapes and types of coral present. Whereas at high CO2, you just get these dome parietes um, type corals and a lot of CO2 bubbling up through the seafloor, but very little coral reef because it's been corroded by the, um, the high CO2 conditions. So for example, at that site, um, lots of studies have shown that the, the effects of CO2 can be direct, but they can also be indirect. So for example, um, the effects of high CO2 on the behavior of fish is direct, whereas the, um, the catastrophic decline in biodiversity is both direct and indirect. So the loss of the diversity of the different types of corals, for example, means that many of the types of fish that would normally occur on a coral reef simply can't occur there because the diversity of the corals aren't there. The same is true of the zooplankton that migrate out of the reef at night and back into the reef in the day. Their, their diversity is much reduced because the habitat has been simplified and is much reduced in its complexity. Now there's been um, a mistake I've made along the way, which is uh, assuming that organisms that are doing, uh, are abundant at high CO2 levels are thriving. So there's a few papers I, I, I was involved with that talked about um, organisms thriving at high CO2. So for example, these, um, these anemones and also jellyfish, for example, they, they seem to be, to the eye, unaffected by, uh, by carbon dioxide and you get high abundances when the CO2 levels are high. But investigating these conditions a bit more carefully shows that um, actually these animals can be highly stressed by the high CO2, even though that they're in abundance, um, you can detect the fact that they're stressed by their, um, the way they regulate their, um, their genes. So perhaps we should have been using the term survive 
rather than thrive in those sorts of conditions. And I'll strengthen that point here with the example of seagrasses. So here's a picture of a seagrass bed at high CO2 levels in the Mediterranean. And you can see it looks lush, it looks fantastic, it looks really um, amazing. Well, you actually see the same effect in Papua New Guinea at various sites. You see a huge increase in the amount of seagrass biomass and uh, the amount of um, below ground carbon sequestration because of the seagrasses. But actually, um, when you investigate the habitat itself, um, you can tell it's also stressed. So there's a much lower diversity of marine life in these seagrass beds, even though the seagrass is growing well and growing fast. Um, there's a much lower diversity because, for example, uh, the blades of the grass are devoid of calcareous marine life because it's, it's dissolved away by the high CO2. If you look at the sediments down a microscope, you see that, that the sediments have lost much of their calcareous diversity. And you also notice these um, high CO2 seabeds that there's lots of invasive species. And some of these invasive species actually benefit from the high CO2. Now, there's a, a load of work that there isn't time to go into that details how the, the physiology of some of the algae and some of the seagrass beds actually uh, benefits from increases in CO2. And those benefits are mediated by light levels and nutrient levels. So for example, in eutrophic areas with lots of nitrogen and phosphates in the water, if you add CO2 as well, that means certain forms of algae can grow really fast. And unfortunately, some of those forms of algae are either invasive or toxic. And so you can get an exacerbation of this eutrophication pro problem through toxic algae. If we switch over to um, animals, um, then we've, we've found basically that the stress of uh, ocean acidification actually affects all the, all the physiological processes of the, of the organism. So on these pie charts, it's showing you um, the amount of energy that goes into metabolism, the amount that goes into growth, and the amount into reproduction. Now that is changed completely when organisms are stressed, they put a lot more energy into their metabolism to stay alive and a lot less into growth and reproduction. And so it's interesting when we compare what we see at CO2 seep systems with the fossil record that shows that when ocean acidification caused mass extinctions of life in the ocean before, um, some of the fossil organisms that survived, survived in a dwarf form. And that dwarf form often occurs at CO2 seep systems. And Marco Malazzo might talk about this a bit later, but it's very interesting that these CO2 seep systems um, mimic what we know has occurred in the fossil record when um, CO2 has hit our oceans. Now, of course, um, we're interested in the combined effects of um, warming plus acidification. And you might think that CO2 seep systems aren't very good at doing that, but we found ways of, of approaching this problem. Because, for example, you can get a heat wave at a, a CO2 seep system. And so Ricardo, who will be talking later, um, came up with a really nice set of experiments looking at bryozoans, corals, uh, bivalve mollusks and, and, um, and limpets, and transplanted these organisms into the high CO2 conditions. And often, um, for most of the year, those organisms were fine. So this picture here is showing you a coral that's been transplanted to high CO2 conditions, and it's growing fine. It's doing great because it's, um, it's algae that live inside it, like the extra CO2, and yeah, it, it can cope. But when um, a heat wave hit this area, then the polyps of the coral retracted and that exposed the skeleton of the coral colony to corrosive water. And then the corrosive water started to eat away at what would otherwise have been protected. And the coral eventually died because the combined effect of warming and ocean acidification was lethal to this type of um, animal. And we found this across the board with different types of taxa. Uh, 
So that combined effect of um, ocean acidification and warming is um, a really dangerous and problematic um, combination. Now, you'll see in the literature that the effects of warming on temperate ecosystems is often called tropicalization, whereby um, you get tropical organisms living in an area that used to be temperate. And apologies for this, it's a bit of fun really, but it's to show you that that tropicalization um, term sometimes makes people think of the future being wonderful because the effect of ocean, acidif ocean acidification and warming will be that you get this explosion of diversity of tropical forms of life at high um, latitudes. So um, Sylvan and his team in Japan have been looking at this specific um, issue. And unfortunately, what we find is that generally speaking, you get a simplification of the system rather than an explosion of diversity of tropical life forms at high latitudes. So um, the fish, for example, are much reduced in their diversity at high CO2 and the whole set of habitats that occur are simplified rather than um, made more exciting by the combined effects of, of warming and acidification. Now, all of this has been made possible thanks to um, the University of Scuba's strong support uh, of this, um, this scheme. This is their research vessel that takes us out to these CO2 systems and the, the staff are absolutely excellent and the, uh, and, the, and the people on site are wonderful in helping us make these um, discoveries. So here's a, a couple of videos to show you what it looks like on the seabed when you've got the combined effect of ocean acidification and warming and then when you've got the combined effect of a little bit of ocean acidification and warming. So top there is the, the strong acidification and warming. And this baited um, underwater video camera is showing you basically that there's very little habitat diversity. It's showing a couple of fish fighting, but there's not many types of fish there. Whereas the video at the bottom is showing what the future could be like if we manage to um, adhere to the Paris Agreement on CO2 emissions and the Convention on Biodiversity to avoid overfishing uh, seabed habitats. And you see there's a lot more diversity of organisms living on the rocky reefs and a lot more fish as a consequence. And this is kind of the future we want, right? Um, we don't want the top image there, we want the bottom image. So, what we're trying to do with this kind of project is provide the science that will back up the arguments that are made about the ocean that we want in the future. Here's a piece of work that um, I did based on the data that we collected in temperate systems and tropical systems, showing that basically, as you increase CO2 levels in the sea, you get a reduction in, for example, habitat complexity or species richness, or the amount of food that can be uh, provided or the amount of coast that's protected and so on. Um, we know that because we can see it with our own eyes as CO2 levels increase um, at these systems. But the flip side is that with good management of the ocean and with um, strong reductions in CO2 emissions, we get a massive benefit in terms of ecosystem services. And I, I, I know Haruko is gonna talk about um, a system she's been studying where it's certainly not all doom and gloom. And if you protect the habitats we've got, it's likely that these ecosystem services will be saved. Okay, so I'm sort of wrapping up now. Um, what we wanna do with this Japanese led and um, Italian and French um, assisted uh, project is to make sure that the science that we are producing helps uh, bodies like Go On, which we've just heard from Jan, um, need to our help, and IOC UNESCO, and all of these organizations, because they, they rely on information coming in from our sorts of projects um, to help them with their efforts to make sure that the global society does the right thing in terms of protecting our ocean resources. Okay, so um, thank you very much for listening.
And with that, I'll just uh, stop sharing my presentation.